ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له وان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم اما بعد فان خير الحديث كتاب الله تعالى وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار all praise and thanks belong to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most high and the most merciful we thank him and we seek his help and aid and forgiveness and we ask him to protect us from the evil of ourselves and the sins that we commit indeed whosoever allah guides no one can lead astray and whosoever allah leads astray no one can guide i bear witness that there is no one worthy of worship except allah alone and that muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his slave and messenger the best of speech is the book of allah and the best of guidance is the guidance of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the worst of religious matters are those that are innovated and every religious innovation is a bid'ah and every bid'ah is misguidance and every misguidance will be in hellfire amma ba'd we are living in very interesting and trying times times when there is wave after wave of muslim persecution persecution of muslims where in some lands they're being held in large concentration camps in other areas their lands are being turned into a big jail or a concentration camp when there is curfews and mass arrests and limitless numbers of atrocities being committed some documented and some not some are noticed and some go unnoticed so in almost every spot in every continent muslims are facing increasing difficulties and with that also there is the attempt the more dangerous attempt at changing islam itself at challenging the basics and fundamentals of Islam so that Islam is no longer Islam and what we used to know before to be the foundations of our faith are being challenged internally whereas before they were being challenged externally here comes the day of ashura and the lessons from the day of ashura to shed some light on what is happening to us and lend some support but not only support guidance and insight into how to combat all of this and how to change our circumstances we know very well that rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he came to medina they saw he saw that the people of the book the jews of medina were commemorating that day the day of ashura and he asked them why are you doing this and they said that this is a day hadha yawmun najjallahu fihi musa min fir'aun wa qawmi he says this is a day where allah has saved musa and the people of musa musa alayhi salam the prophet of allah he saved them from pharaoh and his people so he fasted that day out of thankfulness so we also fast that day out of thankfulness so he said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam nahnu awla bi musa minkum we're closer to musa and more worthy of him than you are fasamahu wa amara bi siyamih so he fasted that day and he commanded the muslims to fast so in that initial stage the fasting of the day of ashura was an obligation it was not recommended until the fasting of ramadan came and then ashura became only a voluntary recommended fast but in that year it was an obligation on every single muslim alive then in medina who knew about it to fast ashura 
And up until today, until the day of judgment, every single year, we encounter that day and we remember in that day what Allah Azza wa Jalla has done to Musa and his people and to Pharaoh and his people. And in that are lessons for us. We're not going to simply fast that day and only for the sake of the reward that is in it. That is praiseworthy that you remember. And I would ask you to remember and have that niya present that I'm fasting that day because Rasulullah sallallahu commanded it. Even if you don't understand why yet, but Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa commanded it. And I'm seeking through that fast the forgiveness of the past year. Because this is what he said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It will expiate, forgive the sins of the past year. One single day. To erase the sins of the past year. So I want to fast it for this reason, definitely. But if you think about it, why is it that Allah azza wa wanted the Muslims every single year to remember that story. Because there is something in it that resembles our situation today. In one of the ayahs, Allah Azza wa Jal says that Musa says to his people, وَقَالَ مُوسَى لِقَوْمِهِ اسْتَعِينُوا بِاللَّهِ وَاصْبِرُوا إِنَّ الْأَرْضَ لِلَّهِ يُورِثُهَا مَنْ يَشَاءُ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ وَالْعَاقِبَةُ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ his Musa turned to his people and he said, Seek Allah's help and be patient. Indeed, the land belongs to Allah and He gives it to whomever He wants. They become its caretakers. Allah Azza wa Jal is the owner of each land. And final victory, Al Aqibah, the outcome, belongs to who? The people of Taqwa. We think about these statements. Today, many Muslims around the world, they have no power to repel the evil that they're facing. And as you stand witnessing all of this evil, you may have nothing more than your dua. And some of us in witnessing the onslaught of these waves of persecution and frustrations may grow desperate and they say, where is Allah Azza wa Jal? Why doesn't Allah champion us? When is this going to end? Simply, what is it that we can do? And what can we do to stop this? And Musa alayhi salam, I want you to put yourself in their shoes for a minute. Musa alayhi salam is a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of the best of the prophets of Allah. Around him are of the best of Banu Israel. They are facing one of the worst tyrants, if not the worst tyrants who have ever lived, and all of his army. And they have no power to fight back. They have no weapons. They don't have the numbers. So physical means are lacking. But if you think about it, they had the secret weapon. Not any nuclear weapon that can eradicate their enemy. They didn't need that. They had something more powerful than that. And this is only for the faithful. The one whose iman is weak is soon going to lose confidence in Allah's revelation and Allah's promise. But the length of the ordeal is to separate between those who believe and those who don't. Those who are certain in their belief and those who are in doubt. It will separate. So when he says to them, "Istainu billahi wasbiru," seek Allah's assistance and be patient because you really have nothing else and nothing more that you can do but this. But if you hold on to this, then you're going to win. If internally you're not defeated, it does not matter what your enemy does to you on the outside, because sooner or later Allah will reverse the situation if you believe. If you just simply believe, the greatest defeat in the face of any fitna, and we're living in an age of fitna, in an age of fitna, where it's not only physical persecution, but also an internal attack 
on Islam and what Islam means. If you accept defeat internally, then you're defeated. You're done. But if you do not accept it, even though you're overpowered externally, you're not defeated. And this is why Rasulullah says in the hadith that if you see a munkar, you change it with your hand. But there are times when you will not be able to do this, so at least change it with your tongue. But there will be times when even that will not be possible. What is left is the last gate of defense, internal. Then hate it with your heart, resist it with your heart. And that is the weakest of iman. And if you fail, you and I, to do this, then there is no, nothing of iman left. So in your heart, you need to resist it. No matter where you are and no matter what the persecution may be, internally you should never be defeated, but always believe in Allah Azza wa Jal and in His promise. And subhanAllah, they even teach that in military strategy. That is, if you are an empire, a colonizer, and you occupy a land, don't think that you actually won until you're able to subjugate the inhabitants of that land internally. It does not matter what peace treaties you sign. It does not matter what promises their leaders give to you. If the population is unwilling to accept your presence, you have not won the war. Because sooner or later, under the ash, there is fire. And that fire is going to spread. And if people resist that internally and they say, you may have the means, but I'm going to have something else. I will ask Allah for support. And I'll be patient. Because if I do that, and if I have taqwa, Allah will give me power over you. Allah will guide me to the ways of doing that. This is a test. And what we're going through is a test. So in the face of fitna, remember Musa alayhi salam. Remember the people of Musa alayhi salam who had nothing, absolutely nothing, much less than what we have today. Fewer numbers than what we have today. But because they believed in Allah Azza wa Jal, the mightiest, and or might, might, might have been the mightiest power on the face of this earth, was completely destroyed. Because Allah's promise stands true then and stands true today. You hold on to Allah's promise. You hold on to Islam as revealed to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the pure Islam of the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Don't change it. Don't alter it. Don't compromise it. Hold on to it and believe. And internally, at least internally resist. Resist, resist any attempt to subjugate. Resist any attempt to change Islam. Resist any attempt to frustrate you and know that you have power from the most powerful. And when you lean on the most powerful, you become sooner or later the more, more powerful. That is one of the lessons of Ashura. Kalla inna ma'ya rabbi. No, Allah is with me and He'll guide me. It does not matter if the enemy is behind you and if the water is ahead of you and you see no exit. No exit at all. It doesn't matter. What matters is, is Allah with you? And for Allah to be with you, you have to be with Allah Azza wa Jal. So are you with Allah? And if you are with Allah, have complete confidence that you're not going to be defeated. That's one of the lessons of Ashura. أَقُولُ قَوْلِ هَذَا وَأَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ لِي وَلَكُمْ فَاسْتَغْفِرُوا الحمد لله رب العالمين حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه وأصلي وأسلم على رسوله محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم. One of what part of what we're going through today globally is assailing and attacking the Muslim character and Muslim convictions and attempting also to fragment Muslims along artificial lines. National lines, racial lines, etc., etc. 
And the incident of Ashura comes also to shed light and give us guidance on what we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to counter all of this. So when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came and he said, we are more worthy of Musa than you. And when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, if I were to live next year, I will fast the ninth in addition to the tenth. When the Sahaba told them, O Prophet of Allah, also the people of the book are fasting the tenth, meaning we want our fast to be distinct. We want our ibadah to be distinct. So in response to this, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, we're going to make our fast different. We're still going to fast the tenth. Because it is our day. The day of Musa alayhi salam is our day. But we'll add the ninth to it so that our ibadah be distinct. He was teaching us a lesson about bonds. Bonds that exist across time and space. And bonds that do not exist and should not exist. The first, the Prophet ﷺ saw that he was close to Musa السلام, even though there are thousands of years between them. But time did not matter. Being a servant of Allah Azza wa Jal compresses time as if it is, does not exist. And Musa and Muhammad وسلم, are brothers. And what happened to Musa is extremely relevant to what happened to Muhammad وسلم. So he wanted the Muslims to fast it so that they would remember. There are going to be conflicts and battles that will follow. Remember the lesson of Musa. Because he is your brother and he is my brother. And he is your brother today. So every single Muslim, because of their Islam from the time of Adam السلام, till the day of judgment is your brother and is your sister. And you must feel this bond despite where they live, where they come from, despite their color, their nationality, where they were born. All of these distinctions are artificial. Artificial. They make no sense. The only thing that makes sense is Allah Azza wa Jalla and those who serve Allah. Everything else is man made or is emphasized erroneously by humans. This is a lesson from Ashura. Today you see Muslims aligning or dividing across artificial lines. You see Muslims sometimes in Muslim lands when they receive other Muslims, they get fed up with their numbers. They say, leave. We're fed up with you. You're taking our jobs. You're taking our lands. You do this and you do that. And they forget in that ayah that Allah has said, إِنَّ الْأَرْضَ لِلَّهِ the land belongs to Allah. It does not belong to you and it does not belong to me. The fact that I or you were born in some place does not give me ownership over it. Because this other Muslim who had to travel, he had to flee, he had to migrate and come to your land, also is a possessor of this land as you are. I have no claim over it. And Allah says, this land, any land, belongs to who? Allah Azza wa Jal, it's not my land and it's not your land. And if by historical accident you have some power over it, wait. Wait a generation. Wait two generations. That all is going to go away. And somebody else will inherit this land. Not your ancestors, not, not your progeny. But somebody else. In al arda lillah. So it's shameful for some Muslims to say, well, leave, leave my land. If we can understand this happening on the tongue of non-Muslims. They, have, no, they don't have the guidance to tell them right from wrong. But you have Allah's revelation. If you hold on to it, how could you tell another Muslim, you don't belong here? Every Muslim belong in any land. As long as they are a servant of Allah, and this is the land of Allah. So these divisions make no sense. And if a population of Muslims have to migrate and flee to another land and you start fe fearing for your rizq, remember, your rizq is not here. Your rizq comes from over there, from Allah Azza wa Jal. So you're afraid that they're going to take something away from you. Think again. Because if you give them 
as the Ansar gave the Muhajireen. They did not hold back and say, no, we have so little, we're not going to share that with you. No, they said, you are our brothers and our sisters, we're going to split everything in half. And Allah blessed both because of their sacrifice. That if is, a, is a reflection of Muslim understanding and Muslim piety that this is my brother and this is my sister and this is not my land. This is the land of Allah Azza wa Jal. But also, as bonds need to be created and cemented, also some bonds need to be rethought. If the people of Musa and they were the minority, the enslaved minority, if they decided to sacrifice their distinction and say, we're going to be thinking like Pharaoh and his people, dressing like Pharaoh and his people, modeling ourselves after Pharaoh and his people, basically embracing the way of life of Pharaoh and his people, they're no longer going to be the people of Allah Azza wa Jal, nor they no longer will be worthy of Allah's victory because they've sacrificed the message of Allah Azza wa Jal. And today when we find ourselves equally weak, and in some places, practically, physically enslaved, when under, we're under somebody else's power. What's important is not to be intellectually and psychologically and religiously enslaved. You may not have power physically, but don't lose your internal power. That is why Allah Azza wa Jal, and that is why Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in this very simple example, he said, let's be different. Because you're supposed to be distinct. You're supposed to be the teachers, not learning from other people. If they have wisdom, if they have some good qualities, take that. But not compromise your essential message of Islam in order to imitate somebody else. If you're imitating somebody else, Oh, look at what they're wearing, look at how they're talking, look at what they're eating. And out of being so impressed by them, you want to live their life. You want to pursue their goals, you're already enslaved, you're already defeated. Your enemy has won. But if you live a distinct life where you say, I will put Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his sunnah above everybody else. And if anything else conflicts with it, I know that righteousness is with him. Superior akhlaq are with him. Superior lifestyle is with him. And I believe this and I will follow his footprint. If you say this, then you have won. If not today, you will see that physical victory later. But that pride of being Muslim, of being aware of who you are or where you're going, of knowing what the Qur'an is saying and in believing the promise of Allah even when others are trying to make you doubt it, that's what's going to take you to victory in this life and victory in the hereafter. They kept their distinction, they kept their iman, they kept their salah and fasting, they stayed around Musa alayhi salam and they never gave up and Allah delivered them to victory. So this period that we are going through is a testing period as well. And Islam, as far, as far as teachings are concerned, is going to be challenged and is being, is being challenged. And Muslims are being challenged. And everything related to what you believe and your practice is going to be challenged. Some of the very basics of Islam, how to interpret the Qur'an, the validity of the sunnah of Rasulullah wasallam, the validity of hijab. You're hearing things right now that few years ago we did not even imagine. But now today people are questioning some of the very principles of Islam that, are, that there is even clearly, clear ayahs, clear sunnahs, there's even ijma' about them and that is being questioned. These are fitness. But don't give up and say, well, everything is changing, I better change with everybody. Hold on to what you know the truth is. If you're in doubt, ask. If you need evidence, ask. It will be provided. But know that this is a filtering time to separate the strong from the weak, the faithful of those who are not, to see who believes and who doesn't. So ask Allah Azza wa Jal, as we are fasting these days, to make us relive the lessons of Musa alayhi salam and understand the lessons of Musa alayhi salam and his people. We ask Allah Rabbil Alameen, 
to enable us to fast the day of Ashura, to make us of those who will gain the benefit of the day of Ashura, and to forgive us our sins on that day, and to teach us the lesson of the experience of Musa alayhi salam and his people. We ask Rabbil Alameen to save us from the fitan that are sweeping across this earth at this moment. We ask Rabbil Alameen to make us among the steadfast, the strong of those who follow his book and the sunnah of his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask him to grant us certainty in his promises, a certainty in the promises that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had given. We ask him subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase our iman and to make it unshakable like the mountains. We ask him to make us give us piety in our actions and to help us stay away and stay clear from the haram. We ask him subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us all of our sins and the sins of our parents, the sins of our spouses and children, our community and the sins of the Ummah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. اللهم يا مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبنا على دينك اللهم يا مصرف القلوب صرف قلوبنا على طاعتك اللهم نعوذ بك من الفتن ما ظهر منها وما بطن اللهم نعوذ بك من الفتن ما ظهر منها وما بطن اللهم نعوذ بك من الفتن ما ظهر منها وما بطن اللهم نسألك الجنة وما قرب إليها من قول وعمل ونعوذ بك من النار وما قرب إليها من قول وعمل ونسألك الخير كله عاجله وآجله ما علمنا منه وما لم نعلم ونعوذ بك من الشر كله عاجله وآجله ما علمنا منه وما لم نعلم ونسألك من خير ما سألك عبدك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ونعوذ بك من شر ما استعاذك منه عبدك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم يا حي يا قيوم برحمتك نستغيث أصلح لنا شأننا كله ولا تكلنا إلى أنفسنا طرفة عين واقم الصلاة